Hi everyone, welcome to um, our, under, our Underwater Heritage, which is the second presentation in this series of uh, talks. I'm Nathan Richards, I'm the program head in the Maritime Heritage Program at the UNC Coastal Studies Institute. Um, this, uh, this lecture series is designed to bring in sort of new scholars, uh, bring in new scholars to talk about research in maritime archaeology specifically, work that's happening basically from the Virginia border down to the South Carolina border. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the collaborators on this series are the UNC Coastal Studies Institute uh, and uh, also the uh, Graveyard at the Atlantic Museum which is part of the North Carolina Maritime Museum System, uh, part of the Department of Cultural Resources and I'd like to specifically thank the Outer Banks Community Foundation who have provided us funding to bring these scholars in to give their presentations. Um, there are also some other collaborators I'd like to mention. In particular, this talk tonight has some important collaborators. Monitor's National Marine Sanctuary has had a big role in, in this project and also the Battle of the Atlantic Research and Expeditions Group, uh, which is a group that Kara will talk about extensively uh, throughout this presentation. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're uh, beaming this live to the web and we have some people in Corolla um, that are watching us and I'd like to thank them for taking the time to set up this so that they can watch us and we'll be interacting with them later via some via our chat room. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Kara. Kara is originally from Phoenix, Arizona. Last, last month, you were, uh, the, present, the presenter was from Flint, Michigan. So we're sort of getting a tour of the United States at the same time that we're exploring the coastline. Um, and she's going to talk about her project on the Carib Sea, um, which is one of over, around s over 600 Allied ships that were lost throughout the Battle of the Atlantic. So without anything else, I'll uh, hand it over to Kara. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Come on in. Hi, guys. Like Dr. Richards just mentioned, my name is Kara Fox. I'm a graduate student in the Maritime Studies program at East Carolina University. And today I'm going to talk to you about a really cool project that took place this past summer involving the mapping of a World War II shipwreck called the Carib Sea. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this shipwreck. Uh, the Carib Sea was sunk during the height of the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, it was sunk on March 11th, 1942 uh, by U-158, and it sits right now in approximately 90 feet of water, um, about 15 miles northeast of Cape Lookout. And this project was very much a collaborative effort. It involved uh, the help of Coastal Studies Institute, uh, Battle of the Atlantic Research Expedition Group, East Carolina University, and Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. And I'll talk a little bit about how these, um, how these entities helped out a little more in the presentation. Uh, starting out with uh, what I'll be discussing in my presentation today, I'll begin with the history of Carib Sea, uh, talk about the lifespan, the ownership, um, and the context of the shipwreck itself. I'll get into logistics of the expedition, and then I'll show you the culmination of our hard work this past summer uh, with the site plan, which is basically just a map, a very detailed map of the shipwreck itself. And then lastly, uh, I'll talk about the relevance uh, to my thesis research, what I spent the last two years of my life doing, um, and how it's relevant to all the Carib Sea stuff. And also, if you have any questions about what I'm talking about, if I'm unclear, feel free to just speak out. I'm totally okay with that. So, uh, jumping right into the history of Carib Sea, uh, this ship was a product of World War I. Uh, prior to the war, uh, the U.S. had largely ignored its merchant marine. So as soon as the war started and Germany uh, began to deplete worldwide shipping, this suddenly became kind of a problem. Uh, thus, the United States Shipping Board was born, um, and then what happened was all these shipyards started uh, popping up up and down the eastern seaboard and that's when we often hear of the, the Hog Islanders, uh, the standardized vessel for this time period, uh, but that wasn't the only type of ship that was being churned out during this time. Uh, the Great Lakes was also uh, coming out with a lot, of, a lot of vessels and that's where Carib Sea comes into play. Uh, Carib Sea wasn't always called the Carib Sea, of course. Uh, originally it was called Lake Flattery. Uh, it was constructed under McDougall and Duluth out of Duluth, Minnesota, along with 15 other identical ships, Laker-type ships. Uh, it was finished in 1919, unfortunately after the war had ended. It was contracted during the war and then uh, the war suddenly ended and all of a sudden the United States Shipping Board had 
hundreds of ships that they really couldn't afford and didn't know what to do with. So in 1922, Panama Railroad Company uh, bought Lake Flattery, uh, renamed it Buena Ventura. And Buena Ventura started service route from New York uh, down through the Panama Canal and um, into San Francisco, picking up mail and passengers along the way, lots of immigrants, and then dropping them off at Ellis Island. Continued on the service route until 1940, when Stockard Steamship Company bought the Buena Ventura and renamed it Carib Sea for its new service route uh, through the Caribbean. And that would be later its, uh, the route of its demise in 1942. So a little bit about the ship itself. Uh, Carib Sea is considered a moderate size freighter, um, and meaning it, has, it carried moderate sized cargoes, it wasn't very big, um, and it could also fit through the Welland Canals, hence the Laker type freighter. Uh, the Welland Canal at this point in time was 270 feet long, um, and the Carib Sea at this point was 261 feet long with a 43 foot uh, beam and a 25 foot draft, and so kind of squeezed through there. It had two operational decks, uh, the bottom, of course, was for the cargo, um, along with the engine and the, and the boilers. Um, and then the top was where the cargo casings and hatches were, along with the mass and the cargo gear that would uh, load all the, all the different cargoes. This type of vessel was also considered uh, a three-islander because of the individual decks. You can see right there, uh, four midship and aft. Um, Carib Sea had two scotch boilers and a three-cylinder triple expansion engine uh, that propelled a single uh, bronze propeller um, and went up to 11 knots. She's a beauty. Um, so some context into the shipwreck itself. Uh, Germany declared uh, war on the US and then um, suddenly had this Operation Drumbeat that was this operation, a U-boat offensive, uh, that its sole objective was to destroy as many Allied ships as possible. And that they did. Uh, many of you probably know of the happy time. Uh, from January to August of 1942, uh, like Dr. Richards mentioned, uh, the U-boats uh, sank over 600 ships. And of course, Carib Sea was one of these. A little bit more specifically, U-158 uh, will come into play later. It was captained by uh, Erwin Roston. Uh, this was a Type 9 U-boat. And um, as opposed to the more popular uh, uh, Type 7s, this boat was much bigger and could sustain much longer out at sea. Uh, there was 45 crew members on, on this U-boat, uh, and um, it was known by the Germans. Rosten actually became known as a, a German stud because of his record and tonnage uh, that he would later get in his two war patrols. Uh, he sank over 17 ships and um, 100 tons of shipping. And that was, at this point in time, that was considered a record. So I'm going to take us uh, to the beginning of March 1942. We have Carib Sea, uh, just left Cuba. Uh, it was captained by Captain Nicholas Manolis, along with 27 other crew members. Uh, they were carrying uh, 3,600 tons of manganese ore. And at this point in time, uh, that was a pretty significant uh, cargo to be carrying because manganese was used for steel, which was significant for war efforts during this time. Uh, it was uh, loaded to the brim. And as you can probably imagine, um, all these guys, as they're crossing through the Cape Lookout area, felt like sitting ducks. Up until this point, um, 36 ships had been sunk in the weeks prior. And so these guys were probably feeling pretty tense um, and not looking forward to rounding Cape Hatteras. Uh, at this point, they were going, like I said, Carib Sea can go up to 11 knots. Um, but when they were passing Cape Hatteras, they were supposed to slow down to four knots, or at least um, not pass Cape Hatteras until it was sunlight. So they had the, the coverage of the Mariner aircrafts there. And so Captain Manolis, as he was around on Cape Lookout, slowed it down to four knots. Keep this in mind. Meanwhile, uh, Captain Erwin Roston had crossed the North Atlantic and had arrived to Cape Hatteras March 5th, 1942, and began, began to stalk and look for his next target. Um, he did see one other vessel, but he would not see another vessel until March 10th, which was an unknown vessel and later known as the Carib Sea. Um, so Captain Manolis kept a memoir. He was one of the uh, members that survived the shipwrecking event. And it later said that he was up on deck. It was the late, late hours of uh, March 10th, 1942. Um, it was early morning, actually, of the 11th. And he was up there with his second mate. And he wrote down that he was just sitting there. They were keeping watch. And um, all of a sudden, his second mate looked over off the starboard and was like, what does that look like to you? And as they both looked over, 
On the starboard side, the glass shattered in their face and the ship succumbed to a torpedo impact and sank in under two minutes. So um, besides Captain Manolis and his second mate and a couple other people that were on deck keeping watch, uh, 21 crew members that were in their bunks all died um, along with the ship. Um, and so U-158 strikes. U-158 continues down to Cape Fear where it destroyed another ship, John D. Gill. Then the Ario, later the Orlean, and then heads back to Germany after his first war patrol. He would later come back for a second war patrol and um, continue sinking ships and get a little too cocky. And he was later found in May of 1942, a little west of Bermuda, um, suntanning on deck with the rest of his crew. Um, and when a Mariner aircraft reports this back and then sends two bombs on him and sends them down 16,000 feet to the ocean bottom. And that's where they met their demise. A little bit of local significance. Uh, the Carib Sea had a crew member on board, uh, Jim Gaskill, that was a local to Ocracoke. And so this, uh, this shipwrecking event was very significant to the people of Ocracoke, especially in the sense that um, during this time uh, when a, shipping, a shipwreck event would happen, uh, it usually took a couple days to get back to the families. Uh, well, the day following the shipwrecking event, um, Jim Gaskell's family, his uncle to be specific, was walking along the beach. Uh, they owned an inn, Pamlico Inn, in Ocracoke, and came across some, wreck some wreckage. And it just so happened to be um, a, wooden, um, a wooden plaque that had Carib Sea on it. And he knew instantly that something terrible had happened. And sure enough, um, Jim Gaskell did not make it and was unfortunately one of the ones that had died. But that's kind of an eerie thing, you know? So, moving away from the history aspect of this and into the archaeology, what did we do this past summer? Uh, so the scope of this project, um, basically we were looking for something along this detail, a complete site plan of Carib Sea. And Carib Sea is pretty big, approximately 200 feet long. Um, and we had 10 days, nine days of um, actual diving to get all of this done, which is a huge feat. Um, so, like it says up there, May 24th to June 5th, June 1st, 2014, and we were looking for a site plan like that. So how do we prep for this? How do we get ready for a big project like this? Well, as I mentioned before, this was very much a collaborative effort um, involving resources from East Carolina University and Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, but Battle Atlantic Research Expedition Group actually spearheaded this event. And what this group is, is an avocational diving group who they just really like to dive on Battle Atlantic shipwrecks. Um, and furthermore, they want to get some archaeological training, which we are happy to oblige. And so uh, what we do when we have these types of big projects is we require anyone who wants to come along and help with the archaeology and the site plan to go through um, an NAS training course, which is the Nautical Archaeology Society. Um, and what happens is we take people through um, and we introduce them to underwater archaeology and all that that entails, including different methodologies, um, ethics, just everything that would go in, just a little nugget of information to start people on this journey, this underwater journey. And so um, the first part of this is we had people go to Lake Rawlings and we would lay out a really fancy uh, shipwreck on some sheets, some super technology there. Um, and we would teach people how to lay down a baseline and take offset recordings from this baseline. Um, and we'd pair people up. And just like how we would uh, be underwater, where you have very uh, minimal communication, uh, we would let people practice uh, recording, uh, taking measurements, and drawing with their buddies and not being able to talk during this time. Because you need to have down like what you're going to be, how you're going to be communicating when you're underwater. And then once we had that down, we would then move on to the underwater portion of this, um, which definitely like bumps it up a notch. Uh, you have to you know, get your buoyancy down and maintain your air consumption and make sure you get all those recordings and drawings down. And so this was definitely um, a good step before we took people out to 90 feet of water and where there's sharks and lots of other variables happening. Um, and this is just an example of uh, what, we, what we did on a, one of our weekends in Lake Rawlings. You can see the slate there. This is uh, one of our teams. And then the master. Uh, this is just a piece of the puzzle, of course. Many teams would come up and have these, and we'd have to add it to a master site plan. Um, when, you, when you were at the actual wreck, what was your bottom plan? Uh, it depended on what people were diving, because we had open circuit, and then we had closed circuit as well. 
Oh, okay. She was asking uh, when we were down at the shipwreck, uh, what was our bottom time? And actually, I'll get in that a little bit later. It just varied because different groups, we had recreational level groups, we had tech divers, we had closed circuits, so it just totally depended. Also, um, besides the archaeological training, uh, you don't just show up to a shipwreck without doing your homework, right? No. You have, so we went to the archives and were able to uh, accumulate some of the blueprints of Carib Sea. Um, this was very useful for us, but usually it's even more useful when it, you're identifying a shipwreck. Of course, we knew it was the Carib Sea, but um, in other archaeological projects, sometimes it's good to know um, exactly what you might be looking at. If you see, you know, we don't just go to a site and maybe there's four potential um, ships that the shipwrecks is, that, that this one could be, you need to have something to back it up to identify this ship. And so oftentimes blueprints or um, construction plans are very useful in that aspect. And we happen to have those because of what I was doing for my thesis, which I'll get into a little bit later. Also, we were fortunate to have uh, multi-beam imagery, um, which was very useful. As you can see, it does a great job in giving you an overall view of the shipwreck, but um, it's very hard to make out certain features, which is also where my research comes into play later. I was really interested in uh, having a detailed 3D model of uh, the Carib Sea. Just another example of imagery that was very useful to us. Uh, you'll note the different colors. The red colors are the higher altitudes, so things that stick up. NOAA, because NOAA was a collaborator with us, and so they already had these. They just didn't have a site plan, so that's what we went and did. Multi-beam, this is multi-beam, but we also had side scan as well. Yeah. All right, getting into expedition logistics. Like I said, this was a collaboration, so we didn't have just the same group the whole 10 days. Uh, people were in and out. If you could come for one day, great. If you can come for the whole, whole time, even better. Lots of different people were in and out. Um, and like I said, people were diving uh, recreational single tanks, or they were doing doubles, or they had brought their own rebreathers. So um, those groups, typically we wouldn't have someone on open circuit with someone who was on closed circuit. So we made sure that the teams were um, paired up um, in the right ways. Closed circuit is when you're recycling your own air, and open circuit is when um, you're, it's just you're breathing the gas off of your, off of your back. And, and Oops. does one allow you to have more time underwater than the other? Yeah, the rebreathers, the closed circuit, when you're recycling air, that allows you to stay down much longer. Um, sorry, I forgot to chop out that dude there. That's Joe Hoyt from the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, if any of you guys know him. Um, we were very fortunate enough to be able to use some resources from East Carolina University. Um, they allowed us to use their uh, tank, their fill uh, trailer, which was awesome because we were based out of the NOAA uh, lab out of Beaufort Inlet. And so we were able to show up there after a day at site and then actually fill our own takes, which was uh, very, very useful. Because um, often we'd have to take them to shops, and that would take time away from being on project. And so this was, this was nice to have on site. Um, we were also able to use a research vessel from East Carolina University, the Cutting Edge, uh, which is a 20-foot island hopper, which if in, since we're all vaguely familiar with the waters off of Cape Hatteras, an island hopper isn't ideal. And in fact, it got um, a, lit, a little bit pukey on the rides out there since it was a a 28 mile trek, two hours to be exact to get out there. And so we did make it through, but it, it did get pukey. <laughs> That's just showing um, our treks out there to the, to the site out of Beaufort Inlet. Also, what we would tell any members that were coming on board the expedition, um, this is considered a grave site. Uh, 21 guys died here. So when, when, when we're on site, we encourage everyone, this is a phase one survey, meaning that we're not touching anything, we're not recovering anything, we're not altering anything. This is just observation and taking uh, recordings and measurements. And so that was definitely stressed throughout the extent of the project. Also, um, we did not go inside. There are some overhead environments on the Carib Sea um, in the bow area and the stern section. Um, and we did not go inside and record those areas um, just for safety hazards. And so that was also um, stressed throughout the project. And what's, what's the, the minimum and the maximum depth on the rift? 90 feet 90 on feet. average, yeah. Pretty level, sandy bottom. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. He was asking what's the minimum and maximum depth on the site, and it's 90 feet. Sorry, guys. <laughs> So once we were on site, uh, the first thing that we had to do was get some baselines down there so we could start taking recordings. Um, and oftentimes, the best way to have a baseline is just one throughout the whole site. But this site has a lot of um, structure on it. Uh, 
the boilers and the engine are upwards of 20 feet off the site. And so it's very hard to have a baseline just straight down the middle when you have that going on. And so what we did is went down there and installed several permanent baselines. And by permanent, we just um, we tied them off. They weren't actual permanent. We did take them when we left the site. Um, on the site, and then once people were down here, teams will go down, let's say they were doing the recording, the bow section of the shipwreck, they were encouraged to uh, tie off their own baselines from here and be able to get offsets off of those uh, other, other um, baselines as well. So there was lots of, lots of recording going on and lots of baselines happening, but um, teams were assigned before they went down there so they knew, and we didn't have a lot of overlap. So people went down there with a mission in mind and that's what they stuck to. The question was, was the shipwreck upright in the sand? And yes, it did when it sank. Um, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later, but it did sink pretty much upright in the sand. So as I've discussed before, um, there was open circuit and closed circuit and recreational divers, and we paired them up um, so they had uh, the same bottom times. Uh, all teams were handed slates and recording tools. Um, and as you can see, stayed within so they could see each other. We were very keen on safety as well. There's just a picture of someone taking recording. Each night after we would record, we would have our slates and we would get back all together and uh, transfer over any recordings or drawings or notes that we had onto the master, the master site plan. So this was something that every day that would be done. And then this, this is the culmination of seven actual workable dive days out of nine. Um, 88 individual dives and 110 dive hours um, from this project. And so as you can see, um, we got the bow with a, a pretty cool windlass there and some chain. This is where the, the overhead structure is. Lots of sharks up in here always. Um, you got the boilers, you got the, the triple expansion engine, stern, fantail is missing. Um, and then you got a lot of whole structure that's kind of just like fallen over um, due to human induced damage or corrosion and collapse. Um, lots of debris, and then in these areas, that's where we notice uh, the manganese ore, the cargo. So, all right, so how is, how is this all relevant to my thesis research? Uh, so when I started school a couple years ago, I was really interested in 3D modeling, um, and I was even more interested in illustrating site formation or deterioration of shipwrecks through 3D modeling. As you can see on these, um, super fancy artistic renderings. No, they're, they're pretty old. Um, this person was trying to illustrate site formation. It's probably, you know, from 30 years ago. But since this is 2015, I thought I could up the, up the ante and come up with something a little bit more um, technical. And so I, I have been trying to develop uh, these 3D models that illustrate um, the site formation processes based off of all the historical data I've acquired, the archaeological data, and my understanding of the environmental and the cultural processes affecting this shipwreck. Um, so what is site formation, you might ask? Um, a common misconception uh, with shipwrecks is that they are these time capsules, that when they wreck, it's just capturing this point in time. And actually, that couldn't be farther from the truth, uh, especially like when we're talking about the Carib Sea, so much has happened since 1942. Um, as you could probably tell with the shipwreck, um, it didn't look like that when it first sank because it had one torpedo impact and that probably left a big gaping hole. But what, what is with all this, this collapse? And so that's what... Oh, the question is, where is the torpedo impact? Um, and Can we see that on the diagram? Oh, I will get in. I actually have some models that I'm going to be showing you. Excellent question, yes, because I was interested in that as well. And I will get into that in a little bit. Just wait on that. Um, as for site formation, as you can see, um, shipwrecks are dynamic, and they are definitely not static. They're constantly changing, whether it's from environmental processes, a hurricane coming through, whether it's from uh, fishing nets, or whether it's from it being a navigational hazard and people have to put dynamite on it so as to get the structure out of the ways because it's a shipping lane. And that was actually something that has happened with the Carib Sea, and I will get into that in just a little bit. These are just some more examples of um, sh how shipwrecks can differ and how it's important to pay attention to that. So let's say uh, during hostile action, if a shipwreck was torpedoed, it would look a lot different than if a ship was just grounded. Same thing when you have a scuttling. Uh, with a scuttling, you have the chance for people to take things off and that, would, that shipwreck would look a lot different on the bottom, whereas if they 
couldn't have taken anything off and they were just, if it was a burning and they were trying to get off as quickly as possible. Um, so, how, how did I go about uh, illustrating the site formation? The first thing that I thought of doing was I needed a baseline. Uh, before I can understand really what has happened with the shipwreck itself, I need to really understand uh, what the ship looked like before it was a shipwreck, right? And so, um, like I said before, I went to the National Archives and I hunted down a bunch of blueprints. Uh, lucky for me, it's not super typical to have um, all of the blueprints on a ship available, uh, just because, especially this, this ship is 73 years old, um, but because there was 15 other identical Laker-type vessels, I was able to acquire a lot of different types of blueprints. Um, and so what I did was I took the blueprint and I put it into an AutoCAD software. I was using Rhino, um, mostly because I'm a poor grad student and that was available to me at my school. Um, but you can also use lots of different AutoCAD systems. I think Google Sketch even has something for free online. And uh, what I did was I basically virtually reconstructed a ship very much the same way they would, re they would construct a ship physically. I had to develop the keel. I had to develop the stern and the stem post, all the floor plates bit by bit. Um, and it took a long time, probably similar to actually developing a ship. Uh, 400 hours, I think, went into this actual, this actual model. And that wasn't all at once. I've been working on this for a couple years. And so it was spaced out, but it definitely was a process. Um, and then this is what I came up with, finally, um, which really allowed me to understand uh, what I was going to be looking at um, on the ocean bottom later. I put some cargo in there, that's the manganese ore uh, that would have been on, on the Carib Sea at the time of its sinking. So that was the historical model. Uh, then I had to make the archeological model and that's where the site plan was super important. I dropped that into Rhino uh, very much like I did the blueprints for the historical process. And I started outlining and creating surfaces. Uh, the problem was I didn't have, I had the plan view of the shipwreck but I didn't, we didn't have time to go in and get a profile view. And so um, how would I get the curvature of uh, the, the, the whole structure and other aspects of the shipwreck without that? Well. Lucky for us, we had, like I showed you earlier, uh, the multi-beam imagery that I was able to take measurements off of. Uh, this was a 3D multi-beam uh, model. And um, like I talked about before, I was unable to actually like see what's actually in this debris field, but I had the site plan. So I, I used both of these uh, resources to develop this 3D model. And this, I used photographs, I used the 3D um, multi-beam imagery, I used the site plan, and lots and lots of notes that I took when I was on site um, and was able to come up with this. You can see over its structure, the windlass, like we had seen, all the structures splayed out. I added in the manganese ore for some artistic rendering. You can see the boilers. Um, I don't know if you saw the diver earlier, but that was six foot diver for scale, the 250 foot long shipwreck. I had a question. So yes, sir. What is the sort of the radius of view that that individual diver has relative to this reconstruction? Uh, the question. Uh, as far as visibility? Yeah. Okay, the question was, uh, when we're down mapping a shipwreck, uh, how far can the individual divers see? And that actually varies day to day because this particular shipwreck has been known, um, sometimes we'll have 20 foot of vis, and then sometimes you can have 100 foot of vis. And so it really just depends. And that, that will definitely go into how much you can be mapping. If you have not very good vis, then you need to stay close to your buddy and you'll maybe get 10 feet, 20 feet worth of uh, drawings. And so, the of the ship is 250. And so once I had these models, um, my goal was to try to determine what was happening in between the ship before it sank and the shipwreck itself because um, unfortunately for us, I didn't have a time machine so I couldn't go back in time and see what was happening with the shipwreck uh, since 1942. And so um, as an archeologist, I could use my extensive un understanding of the ship itself, of the structure of what I know the material is and is happening with the ship, um, my knowledge of site formation, all the things, all the environmental factors, how often the ship is dove on um, and use all those variables to kind of 
investigate and make interpretations on what I think is happening. This is very much an explanatory model. I do not, I do not want to say that this is actually what's happening, but this is what I think based off of my knowledge of the Carib C and site formation processes. And so what I started to go through is you could see the shipwreck is definitely leaning to its starboard side. Um, and the, using historical record and the archaeological record, um, I was able to determine that the the one torpedo hit on the bow side, on uh, the starboard bow side, because that is the side that it's leaning into, so it would have been the first to sink down and hit the sand first. And so that was uh, one of my interpretations. Then some of the frames, I was able to go through and compare these with photographs, and I started to see that some just looked corroded while others looked fractured. Uh, there was definitely something that um, was not just a torpedo impact, especially when the torpedo hit in the bow area, and you had frames in the stern stern section that was just uh, fragmented and kind of blown inward. So something else had happened. This is not just corrosion. This is not sedimentation. This is not a hurricane. There was human-induced damage done on this shipwreck. And so I went through and just started to um, kind of piece together what I think is happening. Collapse versus um, displacement, um, corrosion, and sedimentation. All the different things that are happening on this shipwreck. And so again, here is the ship as it was sitting in the water before it sank. This is after a torpedo impact, where I think, based off my knowledge of all those things that I just said, once it's sitting on the ocean bottom, and like I said, it was a navigational hazard. This is in 90 feet of water, and so the masts were sticking up out of the water, which was a huge problem. So in 1945, there is uh, lots of historical documents uh, stating this. Uh, the Navy salvage came in, and any ships that had um, that were a navigational hazard in this area, the Navy salvage went through and did dynamite uh, to make clearance for the ships that were coming through the shipping lane. And so we do know that based off the historical record, there were explosives put on Carib Sea, and that is validated um, with the archaeological record. Um, and so here is uh, what I think based off of, again, the fantail is missing, um, and based off of what I saw on the shipwreck uh, today, um, this is the uh, the post-salvage uh, ship, ship model. And then this is today, like we saw before. Um, a lot more damage, a lot more collapse. You see the corrosion and the, and the decking. Um, lots of sedimentation happening, uh, collapse. And visually, this, this super heavy windlass is going to just completely collapse the bow part, um, the structure there. Uh, and then based off of all these variables and all these observations and interpretations that I'm making, I can then um, make an explanatory predictive model, and that is what this is. I think sedimentation is going to be a big factor in this, eventual collapse, complete collapse of the bow section and uh, the rest of the decking until it just eventually fades away. So was this um, dynamited during the war or this was after the war? This is, uh, the records, historical records say it was 1945 after the war. So just as soon as they can, as soon as they could focus on, you know, cleaning everything up, clearing everything, they did. And okay. Recovering remains a kind of a, 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 a new thing, and that back then it didn't nobody thought about dynamiting a grave site. <laughs> the question is, I mentioned that this is a, a grave site, and uh, was there any um, was there any thoughts into collecting uh, recovering bodies uh, before the dynamiting? And no, I don't think there was, uh, as far as I know. I. It doesn't say that anywhere in the historical record, and I've never read anything that said that they would go down and recover. Um, and it's kind of a gray area with the Merchant Marine because these guys were civilians, and so they didn't even get the recognition that they should have, that they deserve really, because they were unarmed. They were just guys doing their civilian duty, and they were being hunted uh, more so than any. They had the more the most casualties during World War II, actually, which no one knows. Yeah. That's why they call them wolf packs? Yeah. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> Post salvage, that's kind of a euphemism because it wasn't salvage so much as blowing up the Yes, yes, post Navy salvage, I should say. There you go. Yes, but that is, that is what I got for you guys. Uh, there was a lot of people that went into this. Uh, like I said, Coastal Studies Institute, the Bab Atlantic Research Expedition Group did a ton of work, and I am forever grateful. Uh, Monitor National Marine Sanctuary and East Carolina University. And then if any of you guys are interested, uh, we do hold NAS courses all the time. And so we got to... We have Nautical Archaeology Society meetings, uh, basically the training that I was discussing before. Um, we hold those courses all the time. So if you're interested in learning about underwater archaeology, 
uh, there are lots of available options for you. We do. Your window of being able to do this was that constrained by a grant that you had, and you only had money to do it for a particular amount of time. Uh, you mean for the actual ex expedition itself? Yeah. Um, the question was. Uh, what was the time frame for the expedition? Why did we choose that? Was it based off of a grant? And actually, uh, because this was with Battle Atlantic Research Ex Expedition Group, they were able, they chose when it, they could all do it. And so I was just, I had to do it when they were available. Because this is very much a project that they're in charge of. And I just came on along with uh, personnel from Monitor as just like guides to help them through this. And then I used the data for my thesis. So. Let me stop for a second, just um, because we've got some people watching from Corolla. I'd like to pass around the microphone okay. so that they can hear. And that way Karen is <laughs> did you actually do any diving yourself? I did. Every day I got in and dove myself. I'm an avid diver, so I was down there with my own doubles, uh, mapping away. You bet. Uh, with respect to the uh, history during World War II, uh, Am I correct? There was there was no defense for these. There were there were no there was no military patrol, air patrol, or sea patrol to help these poor you people. You are correct. Yes, 1942. The U.S. was uh, hugely un, unprepared for this. Uh, the U-boats were sinking at least a ship a day, and we had yeah we had no offense or defense ready. For your uh, diving work, did you have a dive master, and how was the diving organized, and by whom? Uh, for this particular trip, we did not have a dive master, but we did have a diving safety officer on board that would kind of just make sure that everyone had their own dive plans because this was, um, like I mentioned, there was open circuit, closed circuit, everyone was kind of doing their own thing. And so we made sure that we had a dive plan um, for each individual group, but they were in charge of it. And did you have any safety mishaps? Uh, we did not, as far as I know. My father was in the Merchant Marine on an oil tanker in the Pacific and oh, wow. survived a torpedo at least once, maybe wow. more than once. So thank you for oh, the yeah. acknowledgement. Oh, yeah. Fascinated with the Merchant Marine's history. Yeah. yeah. We actually have a question here from Corolla. Um, for Kara, are there plans to apply your 3D model to other wrecks in the near future? Oh, yeah. We, we definitely want to continue this. And there's lots of uh, different ways to do uh, 3D modeling, which we're also interested in doing, uh, not just AutoCAD. You can go down and take pictures and create that into 3D models. Uh, yes, definitely plans to continue. I might guess at the answer to this, but is this kind of uh, technology that you're talking about in the modeling applicable to above the water as well as below? Definitely. Oh, definitely. good. We yeah. have to talk. Yes, we shall. Yeah, the students at ECU are trained in a lot of different 3D modeling, and RhinoCAD is one that's very, very good for a mar marine. What, it's called RhinoCAD, rhinoceros. Uh, rhinoceros. It's by a company mm -hmm. called McNeil. Okay. Yeah. I know that other ships, including some of the U boats, have been uh, excavated or studied. Uh, um, now, each of, each of these wrecks is basically a grave site, but uh, of a different country uh, German versus. U.S. versus, I guess, English. Does that create problems, just that the different countries have some sort of oversight over these archaeological Yes, there is a lot, of, a lot of red tape that goes along with um, doing any type of field work on these, on these shipwrecks. Um, but oftentimes, we're doing non-invasive. And so as long as we're not touching or altering or going into these shipwrecks, then they're fine with us just observing, measuring, and just um, taking, taking recordings in that way, typically. We're taking photos. We're just taking our measurements. Everything that I just showed you, they're usually OK with. So. Yeah, you, to, to add to that, you, you often have, um, there's a big distinction between state ships, ex-naval ships, and merchant vessels, because states don't give up the rights to their, to, their war, to their war craft once they're sunk. So they still remain a piece of America, a piece of Germany, a piece of whatever nation they're from if they're a naval vessel. But, uh, but a, a merchant vessel is owned by a company and they might have been paid out to an insurance company and so they're still an original owner somewhere. Um, and any time that that changes is if it falls under historic preservation legislation, like if it's within the three mile limit in the state of North Carolina, it's managed by the state of North Carolina for permits, etc. If you could go inside a vessel and be more, quote, invasive, would that 
give you more information? Are you frustrated sometimes that you can't do that? Or is the scope of what you're about um, satisfactory to you in terms of just staying outside and, and not trying to get more daring and, and get actually inside some of the wrecks? Um, I think it just depends on what uh, the scope of the project is. Uh, for this, I was very happy with the result. And with the Carib Sea um, overhead structure, it wasn't, um, there was overhead, but you can see inside, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a penetration uh, dive. Um, and so there are, there are much bigger shipwrecks out here, like the E.M. E. E. Clark, um, that's very deep and very much still intact. Um, that uh, I guess it depends on what we would be looking at and why you'd want to go inside. And yeah, I am interested in going inside, but it does add a, a safety factor and um, it makes it more interesting and, and difficult. But always interested in going inside, yeah. So I gathered this is a protected site. What prevents recreational driver, uh, divers from just going there and um, um, kind of destroying the, what's there? Well, it is protected in the sense that it's still owned. Um, it still has an owner, but it's not protected in the sense that um, it's being monitored and people are actually like acting that out. And so nothing is preventing people from doing that. But we really, um, like I said, it is a grave site and it is um, all of, it's uh, an underwater cultural heritage site that it belongs to all of us. And so we just really try to, um, um, try to educate people on why they shouldn't be doing that. And that's all we, that's all we can do sometimes, but. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a minority of a minority of people that would go with the yeah. intent of damaging a site like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, the majority of divers that I meet are preservation minded and they're, they're interested in diving these sites for forever and they're interested in having their offspring dive them. So it's pretty rare to find an example of someone maliciously, you know, seeking to do that. Right, it's, but it's, somebody that would Sure, I mean, so. yeah, the, the, that does happen, but I don't think it, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen nearly as much as it used to, and uh, it's, not, it's not the same kind of issue anymore, I think. There's a couple questions here from um, Corolla. Uh, would you describe the seabed around the wreck, the wreck uh, any shoals or drops? Uh, very flat. No, they're um, not, not that I could see. Uh, very flat and sandy. Right. Yeah. Another one sort of relates to this issue of items being taken. Any, uh, any cargo recoverable? Uh, the cargo that is on board was the manganese ore, uh, and it was not, like I said, we did not touch it. Um, but there were lots of machinery items, uh, capstans, a windlass, uh, one anchor. Um, yeah, but like I said, we left all of that alone and encouraged people to do so. What got you personally interested in doing this sort of research? <laughs> Great question, especially since I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, right? <laughs> so um, my undergrad experience is in history and anthropology. Um, and then I've grown up, my parents met in the Philippines, so they were divers when they met. And then uh, my brother and I have just grown up diving with them. And so when I graduated uh, uh, with my history and anthropology degree, uh, very much like my father had expected, I was like, what am I going to do with this? Um, but since I love to dive, I was like, I really want to be in the field. I don't really know. Um, and I started just being interested in archaeology. Um, and I started going to terrestrial archaeological field schools. And then with my diving, I was like, wow, I really feel like I can use this. Um, and so uh, 2010, I think I saw a Nat Geo spread um, on a shipwreck that they were uh, investigating in the Mediterranean. And I was like, that looks amazing. That looks like just, a, it's right up my alley, uh, full of history, anthropology, archaeology, and I'm a diver and I love that. And so I looked up to see uh, what graduate programs were out there. And Texas A&M has a big one. Uh, University of West Florida has one. And then East Carolina University has one. And um, ECU is the only one that I actually did apply for. And I got in and here I am today in front of you guys. Very happy like that I'm here and enjoying my work. It's it's awesome. Yeah. Any other questions? Corolla, can you hear me? <laughs> they did have one question about the number of merchant ships. I don't know if you saw that on there, the number of merchant ships lost. Uh well in in the North Atlantic I've mentioned I should have repeated it. Oh, okay. Yeah, the number of uh, the number of merchant ships lost. Uh, well, like I said, uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, 609, to be specific, were lost. Yeah. Okay. But there's much more in 
the realm of World War II, and that I don't know. So. Um, another question here. Uh, side scan sonar is commonly used for a similar activity. Did you use it? Uh, side scan was available to us, and um, like I showed the imagery before, it was used for uh, geospatial references and altitude measurements so I could create the 3D modeling. But often with side scan, the um, it gives you a broad picture of the shipwreck, but you lose a lot of the interpretive and the really detailed understanding of what's happening with uh, the structure and any artifacts. And so um, it was useful and it was used for this project, but um, we just went a step further to get the detail in there. Yeah, so the, you'll often hear uh, multi-beam sonar used. That means it's got many pings of sound coming out of the instrument that's acquiring the data, and that means that you can get a three-dimensional image um, that's very cohesive looking. It looks like a, a single image. Side scan sonar is a little different in that there's only two channels of data, and it's from a perspective, so shadows are more co common, and shadows are very diagnostic in, in side scan. So it's slightly different t uh, application of, of sonar. Any other questions? <laughs> Corolla? No? Okay. Well, thank Hi, you Carl. very much. Thank you.